Now, <clears throat> the reason that we're doing this is quite simple. Uh, as I said a mom moment ago, I, I guided the a group of Scrutonians through Fools, Frauds and Firebrands recently. And it struck me that uh, with my opening comments during that, those four uh, sessions uh, were these, that you simply cannot understand anything in contemporary European philosophy without understanding Hegel. And that includes Karl Marx. And you can't understand you can't completely understand, of course you can to a degree, but you can't completely understand Roger Scruton without understanding Hegel. Because Scruton, unlike most philosophers born and raised in the analytic tradition of philosophy, uh, very much unlike them, uh, from the very outset really, adopted continental or European uh, categories and style and so on. And he became what I call a faithful son of Hegel, as distinct from all of those he criticized in every one of his books, the, those who belong or, or spirited the, uh, and spearheaded the, the um, culture of repudiation, who are unfaithful sons of Hegel and daughters, as the case might be. So they're all working within the Hegelian framework, as it were, within the Hegelian rubric, Scruton is faithful to Hegel insofar as he is true, I believe, to Hegel's text and to Hegel's ideals. The others aren't. I described them in those sessions as a group of prodigals, uh, you know, recalcitrant teenagers uh, who get arrested in that state and never, never come home and do everything they can to try and undermine the father. Um, now, this is not to say, by the way, that Scruton is as faithful a son as I'm making out, as we'll describe today or as we'll explain today. But it does mean that, as I said in the blurb that we sent out, that Scruton, despite himself, that's important, despite himself, was more Hegelian than Kantian. He lived like Hegel, he wrote, unlike Hegel, I don't think there's any uh, ever a person except for Hegel's critics, his most left-wing critics, who try to write like him, but uh, don't succeed, uh, as you'll know if anybody has tried it. But, uh, but nonetheless, the themes in Scruton's work, the ideas, the notion of home, the notion of belonging, the notion of conservation, the notion of attachment to the world, to sacred things, to values, customs, ideals, all of this is full-blooded Hegelianism. And yet, Scruton is more loyal to one figure than any other figure in the history of philosophy, and that is Immanuel Kant. Why is this? Why is there this dichotomy? Now, this is not a lecture series about Scruton, but I want you to be aware that the reason we're doing this is so that you can see that there was this contradiction in Roger's work. And it's the one thing we always argued about. We argued about nothing else, but we did argue about this. Uh, why? Why is it that at the core of your work are these Hegelian concepts, these Hegelian ideas, this, or sorry, this Kantian concepts, this Kantian framework, and yet you live like an Hegelian, uh, you, your worldview is Hegelian, and so on. Now, Roger did, as again I made clear in that blurb that we sent out to you, did acknowledge Hegel as, the, as the, the greatest and most important of all conservative philosophers. Why was that? Why not Edmund Burke, for example? Why not Bradley? Why not any of the people that we list as the great conservatives? Why, why Hegel? Notably, he didn't say Kant, and for reasons I'll explain momentarily. Uh, compounding the contradiction at the heart of Roger's work, but nonetheless, we'll get there. But the reason he did so, the reason he earmarked Hegel as the most important of the conservative philosophers was because his work gives metaphysical foundations to conservatism. Metaphysical foundations. 
You see, we can all be conservatives and we can all, you know, say we want to cherish things and conserve things uh, and retain the things that are ours and, uh, you know, uh, uphold the ancient bequest of absent generations and all of this sort of thing. We can all use our Burkean language to defend that stance, but that, that is only a polemical stance. You know, if you stand up against a left wing critic or a, a progressive critic, and you've got to defend those things from critics who are steeped in liberal philosophy, how do you do it? You cannot do it through polemics. You've got to do it through cogent, rational argument. And Hegel gives us that. Hegel gives philosophical foundations to the concept of home. So it's not merely a longing for things not to change or some sort of, you know, uh, nostalgic uh, yearning for certainty and for, uh, you know, uh, uh, something to hook our, our, our traditions to. It's not that. Hegel tells us that the way we are in the world, the way we see the world, the way we understand the world will bring us to that point where conservatism, even though one doesn't have to say that name, but the retention of things, the retention of things is essential to self-identity. And we get on to uh, much further down describing what the precise nature of, of identity is for Hegel, but suffice to say for the time being that your identity in the world and as part of the world as an, uh, and as a knowing subject is intrinsically bound up with understanding the world as something given to you, not something that you make, not something that you fashion from nowhere, but that is given to you and given to you in terms of all of these great concepts that we'll delve deeper into momentarily, such as spirit, mind, consciousness, and of course, home. But this leaves us still with the problem of uh, uh, Scruton's Kantianism versus his Hegelianism. Now, you may, those of you who have read uh, our book, Conversations with Roger Scruton, and when I say our book, I don't, I'm not using the royal we, I'm referring to Rogers and my book, because that's the way I always saw it as a joint endeavor. Um, uh, you will notice that one of the startling facts that emerges from that book is that he wrote the Kant book, the short little Kant book that is now called A Short Introduction to Kant in the Oxford series in four days, four days. Having read the, the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant's uh, magnum opus, uh, uh, 10 times, he says. He just read it 10 times, over and over and over and over again. And then he sat down and in four days in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, what was uh, the, the Czechoslovakia then, uh, I, I believe, uh, and wrote it in four days. Now for the, uh, you know, I've spoken to Kant scholars and they all agree that this is a masterpiece. Short, but it is a masterpiece. Um, it's a masterpiece of concision, it's a masterpiece of understanding, it's a masterpiece of um, intellectual precision, uh, and you should read it if you want to understand Kant. But again, still we're at the problem. Why does he opt for Kant? And by the way, why does he argue with me against Hegel? Big problem. A really big problem. You see, the thing is, my own, if, if, I'm to, if, if I have to hazard a, a, a response, it is that Roger was torn ultimately between the clarity and the scientific uh, uh, concision of the analytic tradition that he was first drawn to and his more cultural worldly side, you know, uh, that we are all familiar with. He reconciles these through 
his work in phenomenology and on the human person. He sees analytic philosophy as, as, as something that's lifeless, ultimately, and that doesn't deal with the, 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 the predicament of human beings in the world. And yet he doesn't want to let it go. And one person who does bridge the divide between the two uh, uh, modes of philosophy, if you like, the European continental style and the, uh, the, the analytic tradition is Immanuel Kant. He's, he's, he's borrowed uh, from by both parties. And so if you're looking for an explanation, I think that is it. But it's still an explanation that leaves an awful lot of questions unanswered. Because we know, for example, uh, that, and I'm keeping everything as simple as I can now for people, because uh, I'm presupposing that a lot of people haven't done philosophy, so I'm going to keep things as simple as I can, and thus you'll walk away from these lectures, I hope, with a thorough understanding of uh, uh, Hegel, but from a point of view where you can sit down and go further if you want and delve further and deeper, with the, with the warning that if you delve further and deeper, you might be doing it for the rest of your lives. So, um, but that, be that as it may, that's, that's the warning, it's like a cigarette package, uh, ruined by Hegel, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, so the, 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 the main question that it, it leaves for us unanswered is that if Kant, you see, is, is, is the father of liberalism, right? He's, he leads you into this pure, abstract, universalist, philosophy, universalist, his moral philosophy is drained of all contextual rootedness in the world. And yet you cannot understand Roger Scruton's theory of cognitive dualism without understanding Kant, because it is Kant primarily. You can't understand Roger Scruton's theory of the sacred or the transcendental without understanding Kant, because it is Kant. And yet, here we have this great philosopher of the universal, this great philosophy of the borderless world, versus this thinker who defends nations, defends settlements, ancient settlements, defends local customs, defends home, not as our common home, to, to cite uh, Pope Francis. No, it's not a com our common home, it's our home, our actual home, our nation, our state, our actual homes and so forth, our, our villages and, and so on. Uh, And so while Roger makes a good stab and an excellent stab, I think, at giving us a, a vision of the conservative view and of the human predicament that is rooted in his Kantian philosophy, my contention and my argument with him is he should have always gone the extra mile. And the extra mile is go where Hegel goes. Because then you truly can defend. And I'll come back to all of this at the end of the series, by the way, when uh, at the end, when uh, and we'll talk about the transcendental and the, and the, and the, and the sacred and so on in, in Scruton and show how having gone through Hegel, it makes much more sense for him to have gone the full distance with Hegel. But it makes it, it allows you to defend, uh, uh, you know, your view, your local view of the world or your local view of, of the human being uh, without having recourse uh, to universalist philosophy, which will lead you inevitably into defending positions that you can't defend. Now, what do I mean by that? Kant had a, this idea that, uh, that the philosophers among you will know this, I'm, I'm simplifying again to make it accessible, but Kant had this idea that on one side of our understanding are the categories, what he called categories, categories of thought, 
space, time, causation, and so on. And on the other side is the world, what he called the manifold of intuition. And when we seek to know or to understand, there is this confrontation between the categories in our minds, the understanding, and what he called the manifold of intuition, or all the sensible data that rushes in at us you know, when we open our eyes. And thus, when the categories get to work on the manifold intu of intuition, or all the sensible data, they organize it in a certain way. For us to understand it. Now there is, a, a, there is something obviously happens in this process. The world as it is in itself, outside of human understanding, is on one side of the divide. And we, with all our categories, are on the other side. If the categories go to work on the sense, of the, 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 sense, the, the sense data, well, then what we see or what we intuit or what we understand or what we know cannot be the thing as it is apart from human understanding. The, the famous what Kant called the thing in itself is denied access to us, or we are denied access to it. So if you want to see the thing in itself, you would have to somehow erase the categories. And thus you would have no brain, I presume. Uh, so it's impossible. But Kant posits this thing in itself as the ground or the cause of all our experience. But it is still something that we are denied access to. It causes because it, you know, it's, it's, it, again, it's, it's the sense data that comes in at us, but then we rearrange it in terms of the categories, space and time, which are again, uh, modes of understanding. And thus this thing in itself remains forever beyond, inaccessible, wholly other, wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y, Holy other. Now, for the most part, that was a you know that was that was a, 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 a Copernican revolution in philosophy. Hegel says that this was the starting point of modern philosophy. He credits Kant with the, giving us the starting point in modern philosophy through this simple thing. No longer are we mere passive recipients of empirical data from the world. Now we play a part in constituting knowledge. We play a part in constituting knowledge. But by playing a part in constituting knowledge, we deny ourselves access to the world as it is in itself, or to the things as they are in themselves. Now, of course, the thing as it is in itself is, is, is what, uh, Kant describes as the transcendental. You will all know that word from Roger's work. And Roger at various points, in various contexts, tells us that we get intimations of the transcendental or intimations of the infinite or intimations of the sacred uh, in our world. And that's what he's talking about basically. That there are certain moments in our in our in our life, whether in the whether we behold a loved one, uh, in a work of art, in a glass of wine, uh, in a painting, um, in, a, in in a kiss, in a blush, 
uh, in any of these things, they are intimations of the transcendental. The, the world that is beyond, the thing in itself, the truth, the, 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 the subject, as he calls it, is distinct from the, 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 the objects in our world, you know, shines through. We can't touch it. We can't hold it. We, it gives us, it, it smiles back at us and then it withdraws. There's a, there's a very funny moment in, in conversations with Roger Scruton where he's describing uh, his colleague and our, our good friend Fiona Ellis uh, comes to him and she's, one evening he describes this situation where she's um, pondering about the thing in itself in Kant and he takes out a, a bottle of wine, he'd use any excuse by the way, and place the glass uh, in front of her and he poured the bottle of the, 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 into the glass and he says now take a sip of that and uh they're talking about uh Kant and what we've been discussing here now and at the end of it he says now do you understand what I'm saying about the transcendental because for him there are points where you can see the 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 subject from within itself as it were like, for example, when you're, when, you're, when you're pondering about a piece of music, when you close your eyes, he says, that's the nearest we get to the experience of pure subjectivity in a world of objects that we can get. Now, the same with the glass of wine. It gives you that intimation of the, of, of the sacred of the, or the transcendental or the thing in itself. And Fiona Ellis puts down her glass and she says, she says, by God, you know I do, she says. And meaning that she suddenly had this revelation of the transcendental, which of course you could say is, is a projection, but nonetheless, uh, that's one of the portals, as he called it, one of the windows through which the transcendental emerges. Now Kant never said any such thing, uh, by the way, except insofar as his moral philosophy was concerned and his uh, aesthetic judgment, but he, he, he again believed this was more a product of the imagination than it was of actually encountering things themselves, because that would have undermined the whole project. It would have me meant that you could push aside the categories and have a, a pure experience of the world as it is in itself, which is impossible. Now, that's the starting point. That's where Roger camps out. That's where he stays. And we'll come back to that. But what does Hegel do? In the piece that I uh, sent out for you to read, the introduction to the phenomenology of spirit, we get an inkling of what he's going to do and what he will do with us over the next uh, four sessions. He will accept what Kant says uh, about the mind constituting our experience. Remember what I said about this is the first time in the, in the history of philosophy that virtually that we, we are said to constitute knowledge, the human subject. We play a part. We're not mere passive recipients. We're not mere po merely pondering things uh, or the being of things and so on. We actively constitute what we know through the categories of thought or understanding and through the, uh, the, the, the uh, through space and time and whatnot. So Hegel accepts that. What Hegel doesn't accept, and here's the big difference between uh, Scruton and Hegel, is the thing in itself. Now, there are many reasons for this. Uh, and it's hard to know where to start with them, but let's have a go at this. Firstly, the very notion that there is something unknowable breaks down, according to Hegel, the minute you posit it. To say that there is something unknowable is to say that you know that there is something unknowable. And thus, it's no longer unknowable. To say that you posit existence of something 
or to merely posit existence of something, is also to say that you know this thing. Existence here and, uh, and, and consciousness are bound up one to the other. You know, you can't, you, you, to say that something exists doesn't mean that you have a pure experience of that thing existing. You have to know that it exists. So consciousness is presupposed in existence or with existence or when it comes to existence or when it comes to positing existence. All right. So it cannot, therefore, be as can suggest an unknowable thing in itself, an absolute beyond. It cannot be forever beyond the can of consciousness, simply because it's already within consciousness. The idea is already within consciousness. Another example, you say that Kant set the limits of thought. He sets a limitation on thought. Thought can go so far until the thing in itself, the, the, the limit is the thing in itself. You cannot, you can, you know, you organize, we constitute our knowledge of the world, but we have a boundary. And the boundary is the thing in itself. But in order to set boundaries, we need to know what lies beyond the boundary. How can you set a boundary if you don't know what lies beyond the boundary? You have to know something of boundaries. You have to know something of limitations. You have to know something of borders. And if you know something of border, you have to know the other side of what lies beyond the border. Even if you, only, you know it, even if it's only known to a certain degree, it is still known. It's still understood. It's still categorized. It's still conceptualized. It cannot defy consciousness. Merely by stating that such a thing exists or that such a thing is, it has to be somewhat known. So it cannot be completely unknowable. So to say that something is wholly other, to even say that is already to undermine the wholly other. It's not wholly other. This is what Hegel says, and he condemns here Fichte, Schelling, and Kant, saying that you know they that, that they that they impale us on on this 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 uh, the, the, the stake of mutual opposition, with the subject here separated from the object as it is in itself there, as a, an ineffable beyond. We are always in Kant opposed to the world. We are always divided from the world. We have our truths, which we constitute, as I've been explaining here, but real truth, reality as it is in itself, is out here. Now, Hegel cannot do with this. He can't cope with this because he's an anti-dualist. And I'll describe more about that now. I'll describe more about the meaning of that now momentarily. But he's an anti-dualist. And this is a classic dualism. OK, so he doesn't want this opposition. He wants to reconcile the opposites. Hegel is all about reconciliation, not division. He's all about identity. Not alienation. In fact, his whole modus operandi is to overcome alienation, as we'll see next time, or even maybe later on, uh, but fully next time. The whole point of his phenomenology is to overcome our alienation in the world so that we are so fully comfortable in this world that we no longer yearn to go beyond 
or to seek a beyond that isn't there. So overcoming this divide between us and this ineffable beyond is precisely what Hegel is up to. Now you might say, before we go on, you might say that's that, and this is a charge that's made against Hegel in all the literature uh, that disagrees with him, and that's and it's copious. Let me start, let me say, starting with Karl Marx and um, his immediate successors. Uh, that there was a certain degree of arrogance, intellectual arrogance in that. You know, there has to be limitations to what we know. There has to be limitations to the human mind. There has to be limitations to humanity. Now, Hegel's response to that would be very simple. No, the real hubris or the real arrogance is to state that you know that there is ineffable beyond. That's more arrogant, hubristic, conceited intellectually than saying, no, there is no such thing. And that all we've got is the limits of our experience, is, the, is, the, is, is our experience and nothing beyond that experience. So again, once you posit, once you assert the existence of an unknowable or a thing in itself or an, an, an absolute beyond, you're already saying that it is knowable. You know something about it. It's conforming, as it were, to consciousness. You see, you will not understand Kant and you will not understand Hegel if you don't realize that for them the, 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 uh, the, the starting point is consciousness. The very the beginning and the end is consciousness. But for Hegel, and the big difference between Hegel and Kant is that there is no outside of consciousness for Kant, for Hegel. Because the question then is inevitably begged. You say there is. Well, what is it? Tell me about it. How do you know? I don't know, says the, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, says the opponent, as he bangs the, 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 the desk and says, ah, but listen, uh, some things must be passed over in silence, as, as uh, the early Wittgenstein would say. No, but that's that's just uh, uh, kind of a polemical, uh, you know, uh, tirade. That's not a that's not an argument. If you posit something beyond consciousness, you've got to tell me what that thing is, or how you know, uh, describe it in some way, or tell me the origins of that uh, knowledge. Now, in the piece I gave you from the 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 uh, introduction to the phenomenology of spirit. Hegel says that the big problem, and he's, he's, he's referring here to most of his predecessors, but primarily to, to Kant, he says the problem that we have is that in theories of knowledge, we are confronted, he gives us two metaphors, of uh, an instrument and a medium. He says when we're trying to understand the world, we're confronted by these two metaphors. One is an instrument for grasping knowledge, that's Kant's notion of the constitution of the understanding, you know, it's an instrument, an instrument that we wield. And the other metaphor he uses to describe the way epistemology or the theory of knowledge has been before Hegel is the medium, which is, uh, you know, receiving things passively, like, you know, in empiricism, where we receive sensible data, empirical data, passively, you know, like a, like a, a, a sponge, as it were. Also, the medium could be a mirror, you know, the mirror imagery, where we are um, seeing the world through various devices, but we're seeing it nonetheless, intellectual devices, that is. Both, says Hegel, distort reality. Both metaphors distort reality.
So clear them out of the way. Get rid of them. Just do away with them. Don't, don't even acknowledge them. They need to go. As does the notion of the thing in itself. That needs to go as well. Now, this is very radical. It's so totally radical that you could even refer to it, as I like to do, saying that if Kant is the Mozart of philosophy, Hegel is the Beethoven, born in the same year, actually. Meaning that this was so grand, so experimental, so, uh, you know, wondrous, a philosophical innovation, as I say, the, the, the world has not yet recovered from it, and never will, in my opinion. Unfortunately, Karl Marx got a hold of it um, and twisted it, and, you know, manipulated it to his own, uh, uh, I won't say ideals, for fear of putting a gr too grandiose a slant on his objectives, but to his own agenda. But nonetheless, uh, it's, and it's something that has set the terms of philosophical debate, certainly in, within the context of European philosophy, uh, ever since. Because where does it leave it now? It, 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 it basically leaves us in this position. That the old conceptions of knowledge or philosophy, where you have a knower on one side and a world on the other, separated by, let's say, ideas, thoughts, words, and the objective of philosophy is to see how far those thoughts, the knower's thoughts, the knower's ideas, the knower's mind, the knower's words, correspond to the so-called reality over here, the degree to which those ideas, thoughts, words, mind, mirrors, or represents the world over here, that's gone. If you want to know in shorthand what that whole concept or that whole model of uh, knowledge was, it's the correspondence theory of truth. The correspondence theory of truth. The idea that somehow our minds, our ideas, our concepts, our words correspond to reality or to the world in itself. And it is the job of philosophy to determine to what degree they correspond or represent that world. That's gone. Why? Because the distinction between subject and object, knower and known, mind and world, all these dualisms, appearance and reality, in Kant's terminology, phenomena and noumena, they're gone. They break down. Now, there's a reason for this, before I go on further with it, there's a reason for this, and it is this, that Hegel couldn't stand scepticism. And that idea uh, is one that runs throughout of all, all uh, theory of knowledge or epistemology. And it's the idea that we, you know, The constant problem that the correspondence of theory of truth runs into. The worry that our minds, ideas, concepts, words do not correspond to reality or the world in itself. Or to what extent they do. The skeptic is always, always uh, having a conniption as to whether his ideas correspond to the truth 
or can be said to represent reality. Kant goes some of the way to addressing the skeptical problem because what he does, the categories and space and time and so forth, and these modes of understanding are universal. Not only are they universal, but they are static. They do not change. So for the person in Ireland and the person in the United States, for the, the person in Liberia and the person in, in uh, South America, they are the same. The same. But he doesn't go the full distance and the skeptic still manages to run into the gap between the phenomena, the world as we perceive it, and the world as it is in itself. The noumenon, the noumenon. The noumenon is here. This is the, one of the downsides of Skype and, and uh, Zoom, by the way. If I were teaching you, I'd be standing before you. I would never sit. I would be constantly drawing things on a chart and taking people up and using them as examples. Now you're spared that, thankfully, saved by the screen. But it's, it, I'm using my hands, very limited. Uh, we're, we're back to caveman uh, you know, analogies, <laughs> but I hope I, I'm getting the point across nonetheless. So phenomena on this side, the knower, noumenon on this side. The skeptic runs down the middle and says, yes, but still we can't be sure if the truth that Kant suggests that we possess is the truth. In fact, we can't be sure at all because the thing in itself is there. You will always be worried so long as there are these divides, so long as there are these dualisms. Okay, so the skeptic will run in there and will, will worry about that. No time for skepticism, Hegel, because it still presupposes this great divide between ourselves and the world. In the wonderful phrase, the homelessness of the mind, uh, you know, this is what we're dealing with in Kant. There is always the divide between the subject and the object, the phenomenon and the noumenon, the known, the knower and the known, we're never fully at home in the world. Never fully at home in the world. We can't be fully at home until we know what we know. And this is, Hegel, this is where Hegel steps into the breach and says, what we're gonna do is we're gonna clear out of the way all of these correspondence metaphors, all of the traditional epistemological uh, categories and constructs. We're going to take from Kant what he said, was in Hegel's view correct, and Descartes too, that consciousness is the beginning and the end, that we do actively constitute our knowledge of the world. But he's gonna make some vital distinctions. The first of which, and the most dramatic of which is that the categories are not going to be universal and timeless as they were in Kant. In Kant. They are going to be historically determined and changeable. Big move, let me tell you, a very big move. And one which we'll discuss in some detail next time. But for now, let, this, let, this, let, let, let me put it like this. For Hegel, Because consciousness and the world are so dialectically fused together from the moment we arrive on the scene, 
There is simply no point in worrying or having skeptical doubts. about whether our conceptions of the world or our concepts through which we organize the world correspond to the world in itself and that is because our conceptions of the world are the things in themselves as such. In other words, there is no outside of consciousness. It doesn't mean, by the way, that all objects and all reality, what the philosophers called the, the external world, that that's all in our mind, as the popular caricatures of Hegel would suggest, no, obviously not, because as we'll see later on uh, in our sessions, Hegel is all about work. Hegel is all about grafting, molding, shaping the world in our own image and likeness. No, no. So it's not all in our, you know, that the, 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 all these things, as, as Bertrand Russell would preposterously contend that for Hegel, uh, the, 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 you know, all objects are, are the product of our minds. No. But it does mean that those objects, so-called, those material objects, can only ever be experienced through consciousness. And thus they are somewhat dependent upon consciousness. Why? Because consciousness goes all the way down, as it were, to use philosophical terminology. There is no point at which consciousness stops and reality begins so-called reality. Elements of what we call mind or consciousness penetrate so deeply into what we call reality that we can never be said to be mappers of reality, or we can never say, you know, are mappers of the things of the, as they are in themselves, because consciousness and that world, from the minute we get going, are so intermingled, interpenetrated, you know, enmeshed, dialectically enmeshed, that to separate them out would be impossible, of course. To put it in very philosophical terminology, there is no unmediated access to mind or consciousness independent reality. There is no unmediated access. What do I mean by unmediated access to mind or consciousness independent reality? Mediated by concepts. mediated by concepts. Now, this has a number of implications. It means that the idea that the world is merely given to us, it's called, this is what philosophers call the myth of the given, that the world is merely given to us in any raw sense, 
you know, merely, you know, pure immediate knowledge of the world. There is no, for Hegel, as for Kant, there is no immediate knowledge of the world. All the knowledge that we have of the world and of ourselves is mediated through concepts. There is no, in other words, to, again, to borrow one of Bertrand Russell's phrases, there's no knowledge by acquaintance. You know, you, 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 the familiarity that we have with things. Now we presuppose, by the way, in ordinary experience, we presuppose that we have immediate access to things. We think things are independent of us. But as Hegel will suggest, and he won't suggest, he'll argue, and as we'll argue as we go on through these sessions, things and the world change as we change, as what changes, as our mind changes. And that is simply because there is no way to drive a knife, as it were, no way to separate our conceptions of the world, how we see the world, how we conceptualize the world, how we organize the world, no way to divide that from the world as it is in itself, so-called, to see whether any of those conceptions mirror that world, that is gone, that correspondence notion, I have to compound this today, is gone. For all the reasons that we've given you so far, in terms of the critique of the thing in itself, the absolute beyond, in terms of uh, Hegel's uh, anti-dualist, uh, you know, uh, critique of the correspondence theory of truth and so on. But there is one other thing that I said I'd get back to, and it's this, and it's an important thing, and this is the categories, how the categories change. And here we get to the heart of where Hegel is going to lead us homewards in a way that Kant never can. You look at various civilizations, you look at various cultures, you look at various homes, you look at various countries, nations. They look different. The people act differently. But what you will find throughout history is that the world seems to take on, the world in any of those uh, contexts, seems to take on, seems to take on the structure of the people that inhabit it. This is what we mean by cultural distinction. This is what we mean when we're studying historical uh, evolution or histor his the, the historical dialectic. Now what changes? The world doesn't change. What Hegel called forms of consciousness changes, not because we suddenly realize that our conceptions of reality don't correspond to the world. And therefore, we've got to rearrange reality or rearrange our practices or our categories in order to conform to some um, independent set of facts that we have somehow discovered over and, abo over and above consciousness. No, and again, that's impossible. So what drives change in this way? Those forms of consciousness change or collapse or alter because they no longer, according to Hegel, satisfy our desire for self-recognition.
self-determination. And finally, freedom. So the criteria now is no longer whether our conceptions of the world correspond to reality, that being truth. No. The criterion for change now, or the criterion for truth, is how, to what degree, do these conceptions that we have of ourselves and our world satisfy our longing, our desire, all big words for Hegel, which we'll come back to next week, for recognition, self-recognition in the world. And that's the philosophy of home. To be able to recognize yourself in and through the world and feel at home there. You say freedom from what? Freedom from alienation, from bondage, from dependence. The whole purpose of the human life for Hegel is to become independent. We cannot become fully free if we are conforming to set patterns of what we think the world or nature or fact demands of us. But when we come to the realization that as we change, so the world changes. Then freedom becomes a true possibility. We are no longer bound by nature. We are no longer bound by the external world. Now I'll give you concrete examples of this next week. But suffice to say that this goes totally against the idea, the liberal idea, postulated by um, um, Rousseau, that man is born free, and yet everywhere he is in chains. And the thing to do is to unleash him from those chains so that he can discover freedom, or that he can rediscover his freedom. In other words, custom, tradition, history are all chains which deny this inherent intrinsic freedom of the subject. No, says Hegel, man is born in chains, alienated from his surrounding world, and the whole purpose of life is to become free. And you come, become free not by casting off the chains of culture, tradition, belonging. You become free by identifying not so much with them as chains, but with them as a, as things which you recognize as belonging to you, becoming one with them, absorbing them, and embodying them. More of that anon. But suffice to say for the time being, that even in your own life, you will see the truth of Hegel's thinking. And that's what drew me to him when I was a, a young student. And I've never left him, actually, because it's, it's so... There's hardly an adjective that I can use to describe it. I mean, it's so counterintuitive at one level because it upturns everything that the philosophical tradition has taught us about how we come to know the world and who we are in the world. Um, and yet it's so perfectly true. You know that as, and I'll go into more detail about this next time, but you know, as you evolve from childhood to adulthood, how the world around you, even in small things, such as the way you shape your rooms, the way you shape your environments, the way your environment reflects who you are, changes as you get older. So the world doesn't change 
or doesn't demand change of you, you change and the world follows suit. And again, the driving force behind that is your desire for self-recognition in the world. See, it's very psychological too. The driving force behind that is freedom from being a dependent creature to being an independent creature who operates freely and effectively in the world around you. So as your conceptions of yourself and the world change, so too does your reality change. So too do your surrounds change. So what Hegel has done for us now, to finish, is he's thrown us in at the deep end. He's immersed us in the world. He's shown us that there's no outside of the world and inside of the world or inside of the mind and outside of the world. We are in the world. We begin from where we are. And the whole process is to attempt to come to a knowledge of reality. But there is a surprising twist to all of this because what you perceive as reality or what the philosophical tradition has perceived as reality is not what Hegel believes as reality. Because then I leave you with this as to chew on for next week and, and uh, you can come back to me about it in the question and answer session if you will. Because knowledge of the world, knowledge of reality in other words, is for Hegel self-knowledge. You can't have knowledge of the world without having self-knowledge. Because the world is constructed in accordance with mind, consciousness, individual consciousness, and communal consciousness, what he calls spirit. Now, I think we can leave it there, Fisher, if you want to turn to questions.